The Pacers grit out a win in Golden State against a Warriors team that continues to slip. We check in on what's wrong with the Warriors. Plus, the Suns win a fun one in Dallas. That's all coming up next on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On NBA. I'm Wes Goldberg here with Adam Mares. However you may be listening, YouTube, Odyssey, or wherever you get your podcasts, thank you for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing good. We thought we were going to get out early tonight. No Heat game, no Nuggets game, but then uh, the Warriors game, it just took forever. A three-hour excursion in Golden State filled with a lot uh, of things, and that's exactly where we're going to start. A good one in San Francisco where the Pacers beat the Warriors 121 to 117 in overtime almost went to two overtimes thank goodness it yeah. just was only the one uh Warriors now five in seven in their last 12 Ooh. games losing this one to a Pacers team missing its entire starting lineup all the starters all of them out and the, yeah. the Warriors were without Draymond Green again but this game was right. they still had Steph Clay was still there they had most of their dudes that matter and this game was a lot closer than anyone had anticipated still Warriors Almost pulled it out and led by three in the final seconds of regulation when Justin Holiday hit a three with 5.1 seconds left off of a broken play to send the game to overtime. And then in overtime, Indiana, playing on the second night of a back-to-back, outscored Golden State 11-2 to in the final three and a half minutes. Warriors still had a chance, down three with 3.2 seconds left, but Jordan Poole and Steph Curry missed a pair of threes. That was it. Uh, a yeah. really impressive night for the Pacers. They played hard. They made 15 threes. They were led by Chris Duarte's 27 points. Meanwhile, Warriors went just 9 for 42 from 3, including 0 for 7 from yeah, Clay Thompson. Cold. They're 2 and 4 since Clay's return and have struggled without Draymond. Adam, what do you make of the Warriors' recent struggles? Well, I mean, there's a lot to make of them. I mean, Draymond Green's such a big part, uh, you know, obviously of this team. We know that. But as you just mentioned, it's not like the Warriors didn't have Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Andre Guadalla, you know, a lot of the Gary Payton. They had those guys. And you look over the Pacers playing on that back to back and and on the road, uh, you know, that West Coast road trip. And then the guys that they were playing to me, the storyline is obviously going to be the Warriors and their struggles because they're the more popular and and the team that is contending for a title this season. But to me, when I watched this game, the Warriors were disappointing. They were bad. But I was just impressed with the young Pacers team that played with an enormous amount of confidence. I mean, Chris Duarte, you know, getting the start goes for a career high 27 points. To me, he looks like such a veteran player. He was so calm. He was so confident down the stretch of this game. And I was just impressed. I really walked away from this game more impressed with what this <laughs> Fort Wayne Mad Ants version of the Pacers <laughs> did tonight than, than maybe disappointed in what the Warriors did. Yeah, it's funny. It, we're going to talk about Phoenix and Dallas later, and part of my game notes from there was Dallas's coaching just seems so much better. And then you see Rick Carlisle pull this one out of his hat, right. where he's getting these guys to switch on to Steph Curry. They're face guarding Steph. Look, Steph had right. a great night, thirty nine points for twelve uh, and twelve for twenty seven shooting, but it wasn't enough. And when it really mattered, they guarded Steph um, in in a really impressive way. Uh, I look, this was a nice one for the Pacers. This is a stat from the broadcast. I didn't look it up myself, but I'll trust that it's right that the Pacers are seven and two now on back to backs this season. I don't know what that means. That could just be random. I have no idea, but uh, it was a really impressive game from them. And Chris Duarte, you mentioned the career high there. He was a guy that worked out for Golden State during the draft process. Maybe right. a little something, something there for, for the team that didn't, didn't take them, but um. Also, kind of funky night for for Golden State. They went the first 35 minutes and 21 seconds of this game, Adam, without getting a made three-pointer from anybody Uh not named Steph Curry. They went 9 for 42. I already said this once, but 9 for 42 from beyond the arc. Steph Uh was responsible of six of their nine made threes. They got one from Wiggins late, one from Juan Descano Anderson late, one from Damian Lee in the final seconds of the third quarter. Just... The Clay Thompson struggles. Right. It I understand he's still on the minutes restriction. I understand there's two years of rust to shake off. I'm not here to hit the panic button on Clay, but like the Warriors had a chance late and 
the ball goes off of Clay's hands. They initially rule it off of right. off of Indiana. They challenge it right away, and it's it's very clearly off of Clay Thompson. It was the right call, and, and I don't know. Are you concerned about Clay's struggles to kind of shake off this rust? I mean, 0 of 7 from 3 tonight, you know, yeah. that obviously is a game changer. A game that goes into overtime, you just need one of those. You get 0 of 7 from him, 1 of 6 from Andrew Wiggins, 0 of 5 from, from Poole. So, uh, you know, you got you had some guys just not making shots tonight. I The reason I'm not necessarily concerned about the Warriors and about Klay Thompson is this regular season was always going to be like, be like this. I feel like this is the hardest season I've ever covered in terms of analyzing what teams, you know, are good, what have momentum, what's the real problem, what's not. And we saw teams start the year really strong, even the Lakers. They go through some adversity, lose some players. All of a sudden, the sky's falling. They look horrible. They look atrocious. We saw the Warriors start start really hot. Draymond Green goes down. Now, all of a sudden, they look atrocious. Every team has looked really bad at some point this season and looked a lot better at different points. And I think the Warriors are just in their bad point right now. It's a little shocking because they had two months of phenomenal play. But they're going through the adversity that almost everybody in this league has. I'm more concerned about the reports about Draymond Green's back, the herniated yeah. disc, the effect that we talk about a knee injury. It's like, oh, it's knee pain, but it's actually not because of the knee. It's because of the back. I've heard this story before. I heard it earlier in October with Michael Porter Jr. It was a knee injury. What's going on with the leg? The leg is hurting, and all of a sudden, oh, no, it's a back. I'm not saying Draymond Green's going to have the same thing, but I don't worry about the Warriors. There's so much runway for them to get healthy and, and get together and get chemistry. I only worry about whether or not they're going to have that opportunity. And, of course, nobody knows that. Yeah, I mean, the Draymond Green thing is an interesting question because they've been starting, you know, Jonathan Kaminga, the rookie that they picked at number seven, who's very raw. Right. Even for a rookie, he was, you know, all the scouting reports was that he's raw. I think he's got immense talent, but raw. Right. They're starting him in that power forward spot. Uh, and it, it kind of feels like Golden State is just being a little opportunistic here. Hey, you know, right. Draymond's out. Let's try to make the most out of this opportunity Let's and grow, get Kaminga yeah. some run here and some and and and, and run specifically with Steph and Clay and the other starters. But I wonder if that's the right move. And I know that the Warriors have taken the long view the last couple of years in terms of player development, and it's worked, right? It's worked in with in regards to Jordan Poole and some of these other guys that they have now complementing their core. But I don't know that now's the time to play the development game. Now could be the it's a tight race at the top, and the Warriors are starting to slip a little bit in the Western Conference standings. Um, I think they should be starting Juan Descano Anderson. Jonathan Kaminga tonight was a minus 16. The yeah, Warriors did not lose good. by 16 points. Juan Descano Anderson was a plus one. He was the guy that Steve Kerr went to in the end of regulation and in and in overtime. And yeah, he missed a layup here, missed a, but he was making those opportunities for himself. It wasn't his best game, but it was certainly a better game than Kaminga, who's a rookie, and they trusted Juan Descano Anderson. He was a big part of that that huge run that they had in the last 30 games of last year that got them into the playing tournament. I think it's if 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 Draymond's gonna be out for another two plus weeks or whatever it is, maybe it's just time to start the better guy. Maybe. I, the only way I'm gonna push back on you on this one here is that they are now four games in the lost column behind Phoenix Suns. I think Phoenix obviously has the inside track. We're going to talk about them in the next segment. They look as good as they have at any point this season, um, which is a shock, but without Aiton. But they have a four-game lead, which is pretty big when you consider they've only lost nine games all, all year. But the Golden State Warriors have a three-game pad on the Memphis Grizzlies. So you're not exactly at this very moment risking falling to the three seed. Of course, everything is, you know, it's a little bit close. To me, I understand what Steve Kerr and the Golden State Warriors are trying to do. Can they find something more sustainable, especially if Draymond's going to be out for several more weeks? Can you find something? And maybe it costs you a game here or a game there. But if you do develop a Kaminga into a, a more serviceable player, it'll pay off. And by the way, JTA tonight, I, I was a little unimpressed with him actually down the stretch. In particular, his shot selection. He had a couple shots. You mentioned the missed layup. I don't know if the ball slipped out of his hands. I thought he was about to be the hero. A great drive to the basket. Ball doesn't even hit the rim. It goes hard off the backboard. But he took a couple threes tonight that I was thinking, hmm, that one seems a little bit out of turn there in a in, yeah. a, in a pressure moment. So uh, I don't know that there's a better solution or like a perfect foolproof one. And at this moment, I don't necessarily mind what the Warriors are doing, just that they're losing. Feels like the Steph thing is a little contagious. I know Steph has taken the 35-footers and everything, but it feels like everybody on the Warriors is starting, to, like Jordan Poole. Nemanja Bielitsa has pulled up from like 40 feet, it feels like, like every game. Right. Um, and I, I don't know. Maybe that's not the best way to spread the floor with those guys. I know Steph can do it. Clay can even, uh, will do it when he, when he knocks this rust off, but I don't know. Um, 
it's some interesting the, how a team can collectively get cold like that. But it is true. I yeah, mean, it, it a lot happens. of it does just come to can Steph Curry kind of get really get going. I know he's had his yeah. moments, but really get going the way he was in November and December. Yeah, a lot of turnovers, a lot of fouls tonight, obviously, for Golden State as well, which has sort of been their weakness all night. They've been a good three-point shooting team, and that's how they've been able to make up for those things. But again, not tonight. As you mentioned, they go cold. Um, all right. Quick odds and ends here. Yep. Gary Payton yep. the second had – such a powerful – he does this every single night. I think he like, – yeah. outside of Giannis Antetokounmpo, he might lead the NBA in poster dunks. And he dunked on Goga Batazde so hard that Batazde headbutted him and got himself ejected. Batazde somehow made getting posterized worse and got himself thrown <laughs> out to, to add insult to injury. So uh, Gary Payne just had to be mentioned because it was such yes. a big dunk. Yeah, lesson one-on-one and how to get posterized, not that. Not that. <laughs> Coming up, we break down a fun game in Dallas next. But first, let's talk about our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all of the best sports wagering action for 2022. It's a new year, and a new updated desktop and mobile website will let you sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage on all these amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On NBA your first listen. Now, for your next listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts. Listen to Locked On Now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or watch it on the Locked On NBA YouTube channel. Subscribe to that as well. Let's go to Dallas, a matchup between the Phoenix Suns, where they beat the Mavericks 109 to 101. The Mavs had come in winners of 10 of their last 11. They had climbed to fifth place in the Western Conference, but they were playing on the second night of a back to back. That didn't stop them, though, from taking the Suns down to the wire in a game that featured 14 lead changes. Yeah. It was a one-point game with five minutes left, which means that's the crunch time Suns music. Phoenix <laughs> using a 13-4 to run capped by a Devin Booker block and Chris Paul's three-point dagger with 26 seconds left to close out the Mavs. Booker finished with 28 points. Chris Paul, 20 points and 11 assists. Luka Doncic had 28, 8, and 8, and 8 turnovers for the Mavericks. A fun Ooh. game overall, Adam. What was your takeaway? Well, first of all, to me, this was the game of the night. I know it didn't come down to overtime like the Warriors game, but the Warriors-Pacers game was a little bit of an ugly game. Both teams just kind of not failing to win it. This Phoenix Suns game, and I'm calling it a Phoenix Suns game because the way they closed 35-19 to in the fourth quarter, which, as you referenced, that's their MO. When it gets down to clutch time, they have a guy that knows what to do and how to close in Chris Paul, and they have a bunch of players that fit so perfectly into that system. This is one of the more, and they've had a lot of impressive wins this season. This is one of the more impressive wins, in my opinion, for a couple reasons. Number one, they only they missed 17 straight three-pointers at one point in this game. The winning team did. The Phoenix Suns missed 17 straight three-pointers. Uh, and they just, I think they only go eight of 36 from the three-point line. Still managed to get the win. Like they just have so many different ways to beat you. Uh and it just it looked like things were going Dallas's way. Dallas, by the way, has been so insanely hot. I can't. I don't really understand how they've been doing it. But Phoenix managed to overcome all of that and close out a five-game road trip with five, with their fifth straight win. Very impressive win for the Suns. Yeah, this Suns team is better than it was last year, and there are some numbers that would say otherwise, right? That Chris Paul's scoring numbers aren't as much, and then Devin Booker's scoring numbers aren't as good as last year, but. I don't care, man. These crunch yeah, time either. suns are so good with if you've got Devin Booker rotating and blocking shots on the baseline with strength the way that he did in in those final moments. Right. With Chris Paul just, you know, just deciding, you know what? I'm going to pull up for a three like I'm Steph Curry or Damian Lillard in the final sure. seconds of a game and just drilling a dagger to beat a really good Mavericks team um, that's been surging, like you said. That there there is a um, there's a comfort level with this team. There is a chemistry with this team. Uh, they're getting guy. They're getting the most out of guys like Bismarck Biombo, yeah. who Chris yeah. Paul is just empowering in these screen and roll situations and things like that. Um, this is a really, really good Suns team, and uh, I know that's not the best analysis, but I, I still feel like they're somehow overlooked, right? I know because well, the it, it's tough. Here's what I, I mean: they're the most consistent team. They're the most complete yes. team. They have the fewest weaknesses. 
are there highs? Are there peaks as high as some of these other teams? I don't know. I think that's maybe the one thing that that maybe keeps people from saying this should be the title favorite team. But nonetheless, when you see a toughness like what they had tonight to come back from that, just be so focused. And by the way, it was one of those games where when you're watching it and Dallas is leading for most of the game and you're watching it, you're kind of like, I think Phoenix is going to win this one. We're at that point yeah. with, the, with the Suns now where you're just yeah. like, yeah, Dallas played really well. I think Phoenix is going to pull this one out. But the thing you just mentioned, Bismack Biombo, the Bismack Biombo era in Phoenix going swimmingly, they are now 13 and three without DeAndre Ayton. 13 and three. And here, I don't want to sound hot takey here, Wes, because I don't, I don't, I, this isn't necessarily a hot take, but of course, you know, the Suns didn't want to offer him the max contract over the summer and going really worth it and this or that. You watch this team actually has basically the same record, but actually a slightly better record win, win percentage wise without him than with him. I think Aiton is better than Biombo by a lot. I'm not trying to make that, but I do, you do wonder if a team is this good without a max contract, can you spend that money elsewhere? It's at least a question that I think is, is, not offensive to ask when you watch how well this this team has played so far this year without him. It's an interesting take. I do think that in the playoffs, what we saw from DeAndre Ayton last year matters with his ability to switch out to the perimeter and play in different styles. I'm not. I don't see Bismarck Biombo doing that, and maybe you, even and not yeah. necessarily Javale McGee either. But they went small at the end of this game too, and and maybe that could be an option for them. I don't know. It's interesting. We'll you see. You need to have a good center. But do you need to have yes. a max center, a max contract center, when you have the rest of the place there? Like I agree, Biombo's not going to go up against Jokic or Embiid right. or, some, or Anthony Davis, some of these other guys. Uh, that's what DeAndre Ayton can do. But they just have such a good team that I don't know if you need all the other things that Ayton provides on top of it. You might just need the defense, and then that's all you right. need. So we'll I see in the playoffs. If he has another playoff team. like he did last year, then it's you know you just sign him. Uh, right. But we'll see. Uh, can we just take a moment to talk about Dallas? I know they lost, but they had come into this game yeah. surging. I still believe in them. They Again, on the second night of a back-to-back, yep. are they kind of the sons of – are they the are they last year's sons? Are they the version of that team this year where you think about Phoenix last year, they get Chris Paul, they implement this new pick-and-roll heavy uh, sophisticated system, a right. new system than from Monty Williams' first year, and it takes them a couple months to figure it out, and then boom – they hit the ground. They, they something clicks. It flips for them, and and then they just kind of go on a tear into the postseason. And obviously, make the NBA Finals. It's a little similar with Dallas. Jason Kidd coming in his first year, implementing a new system, getting Luka Doncic off the ball a little bit more. Dallas has gone from what twenty fifth in the league in passes made per game last year to tenth in the league this year. The defense is completely cranked up. Uh, they're playing harder for Jason Kidd right now, and it kind of feels like right. And it's just about that two month mark. Right. Where like Phoenix last year, it kind of feels like something has clicked for this group. They figured out the new scheme. They figured out all the station Jason Kidd's coaching nuances or whatever it is that he has. Um, I don't know. Just throwing it out there. I don't know either. And you know, I, I hate to have that take. They're eight and two in their last ten. Now they were nine and one before this loss. They've been fantastic. I thought they were going to have a drop off prior to this. What I would say is I am buying them in the standings. They're the fifth seed right yes. now, and I'm buying that they are going to be competing for that fifth seed all year. I thought there was going to be a drop off. I think no. My question, and it's, I, I referenced this when I, when we talked about Phoenix, but I do wonder what their peak is. Playoffs really do have about, you know, obviously the consistency level, but also the peak, what level can you get to? And I may be a little bit more bearish on, on that aspect of them, but you know what? I was bearish on their regular season prospects and they're proving me wrong so far. So we'll see. Yeah. I think their peak to turn, is determined by Luka Doncic, right? And he's in better shape right now. He's, he's he looked great Some tonight cool. other than the eight turnovers. I mean, but he looked great tonight and that that's really I, it. By the way, quick note here, this game, like the, the Warriors game, both had a coach's challenge in the final minute and mm. it ended up changing the game in an important way. So just kind of a rare thing, but we got two of our best games tonight with coaches challenges that were meaningful. Take that for data. Uh, finally, let's go to Madison Square Garden where the Pelicans beat the Knicks 102 to 91, getting double digit scoring nights from six different players. The Pelicans did. They led by just four at halftime, but then laid down the hammer with a 32 to 12 run and took an 81 to 57 lead into the fourth quarter. Safe to say at that point, game was over. The Knicks yeah. lose their third straight game. The Pels got their first win on their current Northeast swing. But Adam, it's that time again. Take us to lock on Herb Jones. <laughs> Herb Jones, five of seven tonight, 11 points, four assists, three steals, a plus 12. I mean, look, man, in, in all sincerity, this guy can defend. The Knicks get 91 points tonight. You're not talking about a Pels team you expected to be fantastic. Um, but he is just so good. Like He honestly has a case. I'm not saying he'll be on. 
he has a case for being an all, on an all defensive team. He's no one has done that yeah. since since Tim Duncan in 1998. That's how good he's been. But this That's story true. tonight, it's twofold. It was the first one I'm going to talk about here. The Pelicans absolutely waxed the floor. I know the score looked a little bit closer. This game was not close. Pelicans, Pelicans absolutely destroyed the Knicks in this game. So much so that the Knicks crowd was booing the, the Knicks all game, like almost the entire game. Josh Hart afterward had this great quote. He says, it was really like six on five out there because they were frustrated and missing shots. The crowd was frustrated, so they were booing them and giving us fuel. I'm not saying the fans were on our side, but they weren't on their side either. That's an all-time <laughs> quote. Uh, that's a great one. That's a great one. I this Pelicans team, man, with Herb Jones in the starting lineup. I don't know. They're doing. Yeah. They're making some moves. La- last thing I'll say here, we have to give a shout out. The story of the night, just in terms of like human interest story, Jose Alvarado. You might not know him. Undrafted two-way player for the Pelicans. He's from uh, from New York. He gets to play the, in the Garden for the first time. And uh, Brandon Ingram, Josh Hart actually bought a bunch of tickets. I think it was like a hundred tickets that they paid for. So he's on a two-way contract. He can't afford tickets to the Garden. They bought a bunch of tickets for all of his family. And what do you know? He goes out and has a career night. So I always love those little stories. He goes for thirteen points, four assists four steals was a plus 12 kind of kind of always a cool story uh, when you get those two-way guys with something like that yeah and i think i read that brandon ingram surpassed the uh pelicans great ryan anderson for right. fifth place in in yeah. uh pelican scoring history so good for brandon ingram uh coming up we rank the best single game stat lines of the season yes it's a name that may surprise you but first let's talk about built bar it's a new year so that means a new year's resolutions and if yours is about getting fit or eating right, make sure to include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good, you're going to want to eat it. Unlike other protein bars that could be chalky or waxy, you're going to want to eat healthy, but sometimes it gets boring. By like week three, you might be thinking, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? Well, Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. And most Built Bars contain 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, only four grams of net carbs, and they're packed with 17 grams of protein. You can compare that to a candy bar that usually has, you know, twice as many calories, tons of sugar, dozens of net carbs. Um, so, uh, and, and there's so many great flavors to choose from. They have coconut, almond, peanut butter, brownie, raspberry, cookies, uh, cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, and many more. In fact, Built Bar is always coming out with new limited time flavors. So check out built.com often to see what's new. Here's the offer. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off on your order. Use that promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, every Friday here on Locked on NBA, we count down to the weekend. And today we're taking a look at the top five single game stat lines of the Mm. season. Adam, what inspired this list? Well, yesterday was an all-timer in the association. You, first, you have Joel Embiid, who drops 50 points in 27 minutes. You get Luka Doncic, who goes for a 41-point triple-double. And then all of a sudden, Nikola Jokic, the, the nightcap, says, hey, hold my beer. Let me see what I can do. He goes for 49, 14, and 10, including a game-winning assist. So there was three of the best stat lines we've seen all season in just one game. I thought, you know what? This week we're on fire. Let's take a look at some of the best ones from the entire season. I love it. Do we have any honorable mentions before we get into the top five? So I've got a couple, and I know when you rattle off numbers on a podcast, they all just kind of blend together. So I'm going to try to just highlight some of the things that are really interesting. Honorable mention here, LaMelo Ball. This came against the Knicks on uh, November 12th. We're going way back. I love this stat line because LaMelo Ball is a point guard. He had 12 points, 17 rebounds, nine assists, and five steals. That's a... All of those five steals, one of the highest steal marks of the season, 17 rebounds for a point guard, absolutely ridiculous. Triple-double, near triple-double, that's awesome. Jokic has a 26-22-11 triple-double, so a 20-20 triple-double. DeJounte Murray has a 24-11-13-5 line, which is you know a 4 by 5 with a monster triple-double. And then I love this one, Draymond Green. This is the most Draymond Green line you'll ever see. Nine points, nine rebounds, nine assists, six steals, three blocks. Almost a five by five without having a single stat in double figures. I just that's crazy. Dream on. Um, dream on. All right. So we have all right. So we have to get up to my top ten. Mm-hmm. I don't even remember this game to be honest with you. This goes way. This is winding the clock way back. Number five, Anthony Davis against the Detroit Pistons. Yes, it's the Pistons. So maybe this one doesn't count. He has thirty points, ten rebounds, six assists, four steals, five blocks, one steal shy of a five by five. And I had to look this up. 
Only three times in NBA history has a player had a five by five with 30 points. All three times it came from Akeem Olajuwon. Anthony Davis just barely missed it this year. One steal short of joining Akeem. They need more games like that from Anthony Davis, the Lakers do. I mean, that's exactly what, when he comes back, that's that's the Anthony Davis that they thought they were getting. Well, and to your, and honestly, this is one of the things, he's been so bad, you know, for large portions of the season, and he's obviously been gone for a large portion, that you forget he is also capable of that. He did it this season. And any guy that can do a 5x5 five five like that with 30 points is pretty impressive. Number four, the biggest shocker on this entire list, Jonas Valanciunas against Woo! the Clippers. Going all the way back to November 29th, I think everybody remembers this game because it was so bizarre. 39 points, 15 rebounds. Those are big man numbers. Three assists, two steals. Seven of eight from the three-point line? Valanciunas, seven of eight? Uh, that's an all-timer. Not just because of who it is, but even those numbers are just ridiculous. Yeah, Valanciunas is good for like one of these games <laughs> a year. Last year, he had a 34-point, 22-rebound game. Yeah. against the Pacers and then the year before that I remember it was my first year covering uh the Warriors and I was in Memphis and I like Valanciunas I'm trying to bring it up right now which is uh, even better radio but yeah 31 <laughs> points 19 rebounds against the Warriors just completely bludgeoned them he was a plus 24 in that game I was just like what is happening and that was like the first year yeah. where Jonas Valanciunas was like starting to shoot threes I'm like what's going on here <laughs> he looks like Steph. Uh, yeah, he's, he's got good that for one of these in that three season. pointer too. It's such a yeah. weird looking three pointer. And by the way, that's another one. It, it, that trade I think was a head scratcher for a lot of people. At least it was for me. It's worked out for both teams. Val's been it great is. for the Pels, and and Stephen Adams been great for Memphis. So there you go. Uh, number three, Joel Embiid yesterday against the Orlando Magic, <laughs> fifty points in just twenty seven minutes. That's pretty impressive. Two points a minute, pretty much two points a minute. Twelve rebounds. That's more than pretty field. impressive. That's more than pretty impressive. <laughs> I think very... that I think that gets into the category of very impressive. <laughs> I think that I'm going to elevate it. You're right, all the way to very impressive. Seventeen of twenty three. I mean, he barely missed en route to fifty points. I, I got to hand it to him, man. That was a big one. He went toe to toe with Mombamba. <laughs> he did go toe to toe with Mombamba. <laughs> uh, number two always happens on the list, Wes. Nikola Jokic, Nikola Jokic, number two, also from yesterday, 49 points, 14 rebounds, 10 assists, a triple-double, three steals, one block, 16 of 25 shooting, and the game winner. The game winner is just the cherry, the game-winning pass is the cherry on top of all of it. That's all of, every single one of those stats is, is ridiculous. I still can't even, like, he should get six more assists for that one assist that was the game winner. <laughs> I mean, that, I, I haven't stopped watching it. Yeah. Uh, it is un I, it, even for Jokic, it's unbelievable. And I said, I, I said this yesterday um, on a different podcast. But he just he Jokic must lead the league in hands on heads, like because it's just, <laughs> he leads you just doing this yeah. all the time. And uh, and and that was no exception. Yo Jokic and Steph Curry just make me laugh. I mean, I, that, like the hands on heads, just where you just kind of laugh and you're like, what the heck was that? Uh, yeah. But what I love about that after the game with that pass. He says he was going to pass it, but he looked at the clock and there were still five seconds. So he held the ball for a little longer. This is what I love about it is in this crazy pass, crazy pressure moment. He's like, yeah, I was just wasting time. Like, <laughs> I knew what I was going to do. I was just waiting, wasting the clock a little bit more. Uh, number one, I don't know. This might be a controversial one because this is the only game I've mentioned so far that came in a loss. Hmm. Trey Young, all the way back on January 3rd, goes for 56 points, 14 assists, 7 of 12 from the three-point line. That he generated a hundred points, <laughs> individually generated a hundred <laughs> points with fifty six and fourteen, and yet it still wasn't good enough. It, one of the more absurd stat lines you'll ever see. That is the story of the Atlanta Hawks. That's the really season. Is. That entire stat line. I know that uh, Trey Young. He, I think he should be the starter in the Eastern Conference backcourt mm. in the All Star. I know that the Hawks stink, but it's not Trey Young's fault, right? There, it's right. mostly a defensive well, issue. They're still top five in offensive rating. Trey Young, I know, isn't good defensively, but he wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be everybody okay. else. Okay. And, but he's doing his job at an yeah. all-star level, offensively, yeah. leading an elite offense. It's just they can't stop anybody. Um, so, yeah, that's a great one from Trey Young. Is there any other ones that, that you can think of off the top of your head that you feel like maybe uh, I forgot to mention? The only other one that I didn't mention is an honorable mention. Evan Fournier making 10 three-pointers, which is a season high. Yeah. It's the only stat that was impressive on his line. I mean, 43 points, 10 day threes. But was that the Christmas game? No, no, it was at the Garden. It was just a oh, week okay. or two ago at the, at the Garden. So, all right. 
No, the only one I had was I, I kind of wanted to just go in a different direction. Like you're, you're talking about best, most impressive stat lines. And I just I kind of wanted to find the most outrageous one. And I love <laughs> the ones where if you're an NBA player, look, it is so hard to be on an NBA court. If you're that if you're good enough to be there, it's really hard to not do anything. And right. so Avery Bradley earlier this year in a game against the Suns, 21 minutes, 0 for 3 field goal attempts, and zero anything else. No rebounds, <laughs> no steals, no turnovers, no rebounds, nothing. He had two fouls, so that's something. Yeah, he did. Uh, so there you go. But that's really impressive to play 21 minutes for a Lakers team that needs as much help as possible and not do literally squat. Honest question: If if we dropped you onto an NBA court and you say we're playing 21 minutes, nobody knows who you are, so they're not like you know all you know. You just have to blend in and you have to collect a stat. You've got 21 minutes to collect a stat. Do you think you could do it? I think I could, and I think it would be a rebound, weirdly right. enough, because I would just hover around the three point line and just wait for one of the long <laughs> ones to come my way. Okay, it would be something like that. Rebounds happen on accident every 15 minutes, so you're right. That's a crazy stat line. Yep. Exactly. Um, all right. That's a wrap. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of Locked on NBA wherever you listen to podcasts for 30 minutes of the NBA's top stories every day. You can find me over at Locked on Heat and Adam over at Locked on Nuggets. Thank you for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked on Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all of your gambling needs. It's free. It's available on all platforms. Adam, have a great weekend. You as well. 